Well, just for your benefit, we're just uh, coming back from coffee break. So we had a very interesting morning of uh, discussions, which hopefully will frame the discussions for the rest of the day. Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce you now to, to Paul here. Paul Masson is the Independent Civil Society Coordinator for the Open Government Partnership. Um, so his role is to, to support civil society engagement with the OGP process, and he's been a great resource for for us and for the NGOs who have been involved in, in and individuals who have been involved in nurturing this uh, open government partnership over the past few months. Um, Paul previously worked with the World, World Wildlife Fund's International Global Climate and Energy Initiative and the Dutch development organization uh, HIVOS. Um, he was also in involved in the establishment of the East African Citizen Agency Initiative, which uh, I'm going to mispronounce, Twaweza. Can you hear me, Paul? Yeah, okay. Thank you. So Paul is going to, to I, I know that you, you, you may, we're, we're getting now down for this session before lunch uh, more into the, the, the process of this consultation, but also the process of the Open Government Partnership, how it works, some of the nuts and bolts. So Paul is going to introduce you um, in a little bit more depth to the Open Government Partnership and is happy to, to take your questions from uh, a mic here that I have, which is uh, we can rove with. So I'll hand over to you, Paul. Thanks, Luna, and hi, everybody. Thanks for taking the time uh, today to listen to me. And, and let me start with, with congratulating you on, on joining the Open Government Partnership. Uh, it's been quite a ride. I remember talking to uh, some of you already a year ago to see how, um, how we could push from the civil society side Ireland to join OGP. And it's, it's very exciting one year later to see that you actually joined. I was in Dublin um, last January, I think, to, uh, to talk to a room um, like the one you're in, probably, uh, of civil society people in Ireland, and I gave you two reasons why I think it's important for Ireland to join OGP. The first one is very simple. Ireland needs a boost in transparency and accountability. And just looking at the banking crisis and the economic crisis and all the press uh, reports that you've been seeing the last couple of weeks around regulators and bankers, I think, clearly shows the importance of it. A lot of power in many countries, but clearly also in Ireland, is still with a small elite of businesses and church leaders and politicians. And there is just something really good about bringing discussions and decisions into the open. The second point, you have a great technology industry out there, and I think if you look at OGP and the action plans most countries deliver, that is a good basis to start from. To add a third, you have the luxury of joining OGP late. You, you join at a moment when about 50 countries have already gone through the whole cycle of the first consultation and the first action plan, and they're now reflecting on what to do differently the second time. You can learn from this global experience. Second, by taking the time the last 12 months to figure out who is who, where the power is, who should be involved, who should not be involved, you've laid a, a solid foundation to get started. So good starting points. As Mila said, let me give you a small introduction and try to be in depth and quick at the same time about what OGP is. And if you need more information, ask me in the Q&A or go to one of the two websites that have a lot of information, either OGPHub.org or OpenGovPartnership.org. In essence, OGP is a voluntary, multi-stakeholder initiative around transparency, accountability, and participation. And the idea is really simple. If your country meets the basic eligibility criteria, so basic standards around fiscal transparency and access to information um, and, and citizen participation, then you're eligible to join. And once you're in, you have to go through a process of consultation, you know, dialogue, which we're starting today, um, bringing that to a national action plan of very concrete and ambitious questions. I think there are three points which are exciting, especially from a civil society side. First, it really is a partnership between government and civil society with equal power in, in discussing the priorities, but also in managing and governing um, the whole endeavor, both nationally and internationally. Second, it's not lofty ideals and, and big speeches. It really is concrete, ambitious, smart commitments. Thirdly, there's an independent reporting mechanism that once a year 
look at what your country has done on process, on commitments, and in the broader context around open governance. So equality, real commitments, independent monitoring. It sounds all very conceptual in a way, but it really in the end is about better health and education because you monitor the quality and the costs. It's about better policies because you include citizens and civil society in policy development. And it's about less corruption because you bring decision making and spending into the open. What every country should do when they go through the process of developing the commitments is in a way seeing how they link to one grand challenges and I'll touch on them extremely briefly, and if you want more, you can ask me in the questions or again go to one of the websites. So the five challenges are public services, the services you use as a citizen, how can you influence the quality, how can you make government accountable, how can you influence the priorities. Public integrity, which is really about public ethics and how bureaucrats and politicians behave, and it's about anti-corruption. Uh, public procurement is part of the third one, which is public resources. How do we spend our money, which is extremely relevant in, in times of austerity. But also, so who decides where government contracts go to? Um, what price is paid, and how did the process go? Fourth, creating safer communities, which is around the whole police and military uh, and security sector. What are your rights? What are their responsibilities? What are the standards for budgets and fees and fines? And the final one, corporate social responsibility, corporate accountability, which is consumer protection, again, corruption, procurement. Personally, I think the most exciting element is the partnership idea, the idea of, of creating space for reforms. There, there are change agents everywhere in society. They're in the government, they're in the bureaucracy, uh, they're in civil society, they're in the private sector. It's about connecting them and creating space. The first few months of this year, we've done a research with basically we interviewed 40, 45 people in 15 countries across the globe about how did their first year of OGP go. And I think the key lessons coming out of that are very helpful for you today. So let me run through them. So there are five. The first one is lay a solid foundation to the process. And that's what you've been doing the last year. It's having clarity on on the terms of reference, having a coordinator to guide the process, informing yourself widely in country and with other countries how to do it, laying a solid foundation to get a good start. Second one, get organized, especially important for civil society, and I'll come back to that later. The third one, establish an ongoing dialogue between government and civil society. OGP asks for proper consultation, but for me, one of my mantras is, a one-off consultation with coffee and cookies doesn't work. It has to be an important moment in something bigger, a longer-term dialogue. The dialogue, in a way, is the basis for an ongoing partnership. And we see many countries, whether it's a dialogue or there's a permanent platform to engage, the impact of OGP has been bigger than in countries where that's not in place. The fourth one, consult widely, in all senses. So include a broad set of civil society. Don't limit yourself to the open data people or the environment people or the corruption people, broadly. But also consult broadly within government, not just the Ministry of Home Affairs or Foreign Affairs, but try to include many entities. Try to go beyond the capital. Um, and it is useful for really the priorities that you need in your plan. Use this moment already to try to also engage with, with the citizens, despite knowing that that is a difficult uh, and expensive state to take. And the fifth one, all of this should be in the spirit of building a partnership. It's really about engaging for the long term, building a trust relationship, a respect relation between the people involved, and figuring out how you can really jointly make this work and get other people involved. The 15 articles, you can find them on, on ogphub.org. We'll be giving them out one uh, per week for the coming months. Uh, and you can also find them if you're, if you're part of the OGP uh, civil society list. Now, I want to get back to the second point, which I think is a crucial one, and that's get organized. And I'm going to talk specifically to civil society people in the room now. We're not doing this, and I think we have to do some self-reflection here. After we're not strategic about thinking through who we need to involve, we're not strategic in thinking about 
the position of the other side. We're much better in, in uh, explaining why we have the moral high ground and we know what should change. But this is about, about dialogue and listening. We're not good in approaching this in, a, in almost like a chess game, thinking three steps ahead and being flexible and changing our course. To make this work, to get really change on, on open government in Ireland and to really make OCP be a tool for you to deliver, we have to change that position and we have to get more strategic in civil society. Which means thinking about what we need and what they need. Thinking about collective priorities for civil society, which is something else than just adding up the individual priorities of all the organizations in the room. What are our collective common priorities? It's about thinking through the tension, how to deal with the fact that on the one hand we're working with government, but on the other hand we're watching government. How do you reconcile the both? And it's taking a long-term perspective. So this is really a call for you civil society to, to use this strategically, strategic advocacy. Two points I think important to mention while you embark on, um, on on the consultation to deliver an action plan. One is around ambition. There's a lot of talk about ambition and stretch if you talk about OGP. And the second is some practical tips and tricks on how to, to go about the conversations you have today uh, and the coming weeks. Ambition is easily overlooked in OGP if you look at the action plan of, of some of the countries. It's not very ambitious. It's, it's repackaging stuff they've already promised before. And that's not the idea. And the idea really is to bring in new and additional promises around open government. What does that mean? Well, first of all, every country in OGP, I think, should strive to get a full score on the eligibility points. The threshold for joining OGP is relatively low, so getting all the points, I think, is a first step. Ireland is there, I think. Second, try to make commitments which are new and ambitious. And ambition for me can also mean that you speed up things that you were already planning, or that you finally really deliver or implement something that, that you had planned but didn't get around to. Like in some countries now, finally, the you know, information law is passed in the parliament, or finally budget is made available to actually implement it. So there are ways of, of linking ambition to existing Current debate and we have to see around ambition and quality is threefold. First, there's a lot of thinking about quality and ambition of both the process and the action plans. And, and probably what we do is on the civil society side to develop an independent review of assessing the process and the action plan of OGP, say something about the quality and ambition. But one. Second, I told you about an independent reporting mechanism, which now looks at process action plan, but does so afterwards. So when your action plan is finished, they'll look at how was the consultation, how was the action plan, and is the compiler commitment actually delivered, which is great, but it's after the fact. So we need to think of, can we use the same mechanism or another mechanism to also do a quality check up front of what had happened? That's something for the future. And the third one, in the coming months, you will see that OGP will improve its guidelines and expectations around ambition, especially around the quality of the consultation. Ambition really is at the core of OGP. And if we don't sort of, the challenges we're facing are so big that we have to go beyond the ordinary and, and, and really go all the way out and raise the bar. In terms of what we'll do, and you'll see that coming through the, the official OGP channels, but also through the civil society side is, we'll be improving the rules of the game in the coming months, and the coming year. And that's really, really important. If you look at the countries that are in there now, one of the complaints I hear on the civil society side is that the idea is good, the mechanism is good, but we still need to improve it. And that's what we'll be doing. To, to come to a close, some tips and tricks of, of how to go about your afternoon, basically. First, start with an open mind. Don't enter the table with a predefined position, but really go in there for a dialogue, an open dialogue, bring in arguments, listen to each other, approach each other in a, in a culture of respect uh, rather than, than um, attacking each other. Again, it goes back to the idea of partnership. And if, if we come to the table with predefined positions and we're not willing to discuss, listen, or move on those, 
then will not get, get the partnership model going. The second, build in space in the process to not talk within your own working group, but also to, to have a dialogue with the other working groups. I'm convinced, and we've seen that in other countries, that you get stronger commitments around open data if you have a dialogue with the people advocating for freedom of information laws and the other way around. You need each other and you need to connect the sub community. So building that into the process. The third one, think of the ultimate goal in a way. What do you want to achieve? There's a, there's a, a perceived downside in action plans for one year or two years. But in a way, there's not really. I mean, you can have an ambition for five years' time. Say you want the most um, innovative freedom of information climate in Ireland, the whole of Europe in five years' time. What you have to do today in the coming weeks is think about what are the milestones on the path to get there and which of these milestones you can put in the action plan to be delivered in one year or two years' time. Give some thought to which ministries and which civil servants could be the champions. Who do you have to include to make it happen? Um, this is really important. Let me give you one example. For example, Croatia and the Nation Plan all sort of geared, or at least half geared, around fiscal transparency and budget changes. And there was a big champion in the ministry to push for this, an OGP champion. But then this minister was moved to another ministry, and a new minister came in, which made it very difficult to get traction on these promises around fiscal transparency. So you have to be strategic about thinking which ministries, which champions, which politicians to include to get stability and make it, make it happen. And that's part of prioritizing. Make sure you have the space to do various rounds of iterations. The first action plan is not going to be there completely. Think about your own role in delivering it. It's not just having the discussion and then saying to the civil servants, and now go home and do it. This is again about a partnership. So what can civil society do? Within, without forgetting about sort of, you know, the explicit roles and responsibilities we all have in these things, there still is something civil society can bring to the table, if only knowledge and connections outside, outside the country. All of this stuff has to be written down in a smart, way which really means specific and measurable and attainable you have to make sure that they're clearly linked on every commitment that there are budgets in place and it really helps already think of this stuff um, while you're developing and discussing what the priorities should be two pieces of advice for civil society and government for civil society i think it really makes sense to to be smart advocates and come to the table with already well-defined well down smart commitments that, that in a way government could just copy paste and that is what you bring to the table but you also bring the arguments and the analysis why you think it's realistic and important um, for government be open to listen to these uh, suggestions but at the same time if you're not going to include them in the accident be sure to to have a good explanation to civil society why you're not including it and it's good practice to actually include all of the suggestions you received in your action plan and say, well, this is what we received and this is what we've done with it. Listening to these two things and to avoid frustration down the lines like we've seen in Hungary. So let me stop there before I sort of give my closing, uh, closing two points and, uh, and open for questions. I can hear you. Yeah. Right. Um, right. Um, that was really that was really uh, useful, Paul, in explaining both the process. Um, I thought it was very rich in explaining both the process uh, of the OGP partnership itself, but the the the, the, the need to have consultations that um, are are iterative as as the OGP itself grows, because OGP itself has only been around for for two years. And as you can hear from Paul, it, it is itself developing its own um, codes and, and guidelines and best practice behaviors. So uh, we have t t about 10 minutes, if that's okay with everyone, to try and kind of um, keep catch up a little bit of time for some questions to Paul. Uh, this microphone here, which is wired into the laptop, um, will allow you to ask a direct question to Paul. And if the technology fails us, I'll, I'll channel your question to him via the laptop here. 
So this is, uh, and if you could introduce yourself, please, that'd be great, Noel. Yeah, thank you, uh, Noel Ward. Um, I think my, my question really is, in relation to the quality of the various national action plans that have already been introduced, and is there a, case, is there, is there a criteria required before ODB accepts a national action plan as, as acceptable? Maybe we could take uh, just a cluster of questions, and Paul could address them all together. Any anybody else have a question for Paul? Paul, did you get that one? No, I didn't get this one. No. Um, it, it was a similar question to, 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 the, to the first one. Um, the, the speaker uh, is from Tanzania and was, was saying that you know this is the kind of race to the bottom issue. Um, what what is there in OGP that that ensures that uh, standards are met and that countries adhere to their commitments? Is that a, is that an accurate summary? Yeah. Anyone else wants to add a question? And we let Paul. Um, Back on. There's two, just two more questions. Did you hear that one, Paul? No. Oh, so, so what extent has the uh, civil uh, anxiety within the civil service to uh, letting information go been a barrier in countries? And then there's just, uh, mm. just over here on the, the edge of the second row. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, it is. But I, I, look, I can just channel it if. Thank you. 
Did you hear that one, Paul? No. No, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll summarise that in a sentence then. Um, so the questioner was asking about the, the synergy between, uh, have, have you examples of, of um, people successfully making a synergy between the Open Government Partnership and the Our House Convention, which, I, if I understand it correctly, mandates um, actions, forces, um, forces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's a. It's a. The question is um, regarding can can these two forces come together? I suppose the the the, the mandated side of uh, the Aarhus Convention. Uh, have you examples of how that has um, been used within the OGP process? That been accurate summary? Yeah. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll give Paul an opportunity to, to come back on those four questions. Okay, thanks. Um, the first one, are there sort of criteria um, around accepting national action plans? That's the part I took from it. Um, no, they're not at the moment. And I think that's the problem that, that you know, it is... It is part of my presentation when I talked about ambition and the thinking in OGP to address that. I think all these three elements, so having civil society develop some sort of review mechanism of quality and ambition of process and action plans, that's a way to, to strengthen the action plans coming in. Because now basically a country can upload them when they think they're done. So that's one, that's on the civil society side. Then OGP itself is working on improving the rules of the game, which is really about the guidelines of what a proper consultation is, but also considering, yes, having sort of a check-in moment before the action plan is uploaded to really check it and see, well, are these commitments smart? Do they make sense? Did you have a consultation? Uh, that discussion, you know, guide, improving the guidelines is, is, a, is a done deal. We just, I think OGP just has to develop them. Gating up front is a, is a bit more difficult discussion with, with some of the government members in OGP. And then the third one, the independent reporting mechanism can also play a role in, in checking the quality. They now do it after the fact, like I said, but they are looking into, is there a way they could do something early on in the process? So at the moment, I don't think it's a good good enough process, and we clearly see that because some of the action plans are really not ambitious and not well written. So it's something that will improve for the second round of action plans for most countries, and in the case of Ireland, probably for the first round of action plans, you can already build on that experience. Is it a race to the bottom? I don't, that's not my fear. I mean, what we see in most countries is that they actually, there's pretty good delivery on the commitments they make. So the issue is not so much, do they deliver the commitments? The question is more, are the commitments ambitious enough? Um, personally, I don't think they are. Some countries, yes, some commitments, yes. But overall, I think we have to push for this ambition. And that's, that's really where the debate now is. How can we push for additional ambition? Um, two elements to that. I think, again, you have the independent reporting mechanism that will check if a country was serious about OGP, if they did a good process, if they had a good consultation, if they delivered on commitments, all of that will be checked. So I think that's, that's a clear strength of OGP. The second element of it is really, this is not some huge New York-based central secretary that checks the progress of all the countries. The, the design of OGP really is that the core of it is at the national level. The local dynamic should drive this. The dialogue between civil society in Ireland and the government in Ireland and the bureaucrats, that's where the dynamic and the energy should come and that's where the dialogue should be about um, ambition, quality. From the outside, you can never do it unless you, you uh, introduce a lot of, of carrots and sticks, which this is not about. This is about creating space for reformers uh, and giving them the political backing to, to work faster than they did before. Um, it, is there an inherent reluctance to release information on the, um, on the side of the government? Yes, in general, you know, in some parts of the government, in other parts, they're much more open to it. And I think this is where, where really the interesting 
combination can be made between open data on the one hand and freedom of information laws on the other, because they really complement each other in releasing information. Across the board, though, I think there's more uh, there's more positive signals coming from OGP around this, with a range of countries really either introducing a freedom of information law or improving it. Uh, Croatia has improved it. Uh, Philippines are improving it. Uh, Brazil introduced it, didn't have it before. Um, then, and also on the open data side, where you know the, the open data, the data sets that countries like the US and the UK release is really impressive. And the US is really making a, a push for proactive release of data sets. The same is happening in the Netherlands. Um, at the same time, you see that reluctance clearly in the case of Kenya, that had a very fast start with, with an open data portal, but then ran into the problems of, of records management and reluctance with civil servants to do so. So it, it, they're both sides, but I think overall it tends more to the positive. Is there a synergy with the artists convention? Not that I've seen of. There's, there's a lot of synergies in OGP with other stuff which is happening whether it's the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative or the International Aid Transparency Initiative. We see a lot of linkages with global standards around fiscal transparency as well. Um, in Africa, there's a lot of uh, push to link OGP in one way or the other with the peer review mechanism they have there. Um, but those events I haven't seen pass by in, in the action plan. But I think you know, that that is one of the strengths to do, right? I mean, if there's already promises on the one hand, you can put them in the OGP action plan and give them an additional boost or push for implementation of things that were promised but never delivered, etc. Great. Um, Paul, Great. thanks so much for that. Um, it's a really good introduction. I hope I hope uh, it's you, you're starting to, to to appreciate that this is a, a process in, in evolution at international level as well as domestically. Um, Paul will be joining us for the next um, for the second of the three meetings that are that are planned around this consultation. So he'll be here on on August the eighth. If you'd like to meet him in person, and he'll uh, talk to us in more detail about about the process beyond. Um, beyond us putting down our, our, our wish list, if you like, for, for the Open Government Action Plan. We, we need to be thinking sort of longer term, as Paul has outlined there, what do we do in the coming months after that and what do we do in the, in the years beyond that. So Paul will have, uh, will have great, great input on, on, on that one, no doubt. So Paul, thank you very much. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it there with you and we'll progress to our working groups. And we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Paul.